Motivation. <laughs> I'm motivated. But what do you do when motivation is not enough? You rely on your work ethic. You rely on your discipline. That's my talent. Now let's get it. The stage, please welcome Julian Peters. Yeah. What's going on, everybody? This is Julian back with my Mentality Podcast. For those watching, how's it going? For those listening, welcome back to my voice. I am excited today. I got Sooner Legend, NFL wide receiver, and I'm going to go ahead and speak this real estate mogul, Mr. Ryan Boyles. How's okay. it going? Hey, what's up, man? I appreciate the intro, man. I'm, I look forward to, to talking, sharing a little bit about my story and and. Obviously, hear what you got going, and I love the vibe, and I like the backdrop, too. I appreciate it. So before we get started, I don't know if you know this. I'm from Norman. Really? I went to Whittier Middle School. You went to Alcott Middle School. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. North. I played ball against you at the Optimus. Play A, you ball against you at oh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, small world, then, man. We just made it full circle, right? Right, right. I'm like, I know he don't remember me, man, but yeah, like, I heard a true Matt Gazzal, all them cats, bro. I came up with all of them. It was just, I was on the uh, other side. Yeah, Gazzo. Yeah, but I'm <laughs> actually playing with um, Andrew Gonzalez in the basketball league right now. Oh, for real? That's yep, yep. Matt's older brother. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, so, um, but no, I yeah. want to. I want to go ahead and get started, man, and discuss your background a little bit, you know, how you came up. Yeah, well, you know, it just played ball my whole life, you know, obviously as a, as a young kid, I um, moved from Oklahoma City to Norman, Oklahoma when I was five years old, so I started grade school here. Um, in our, our big outlet, I had two older, uh, two older siblings, a, a brother and a sister and a younger brother. Our big outlet on life was just playing sports, man. So obviously we did the school thing, the field trips, you know, hanging in the neighborhood. And really at the end of the day, we were just competitive by nature. We played ball, we loved ball. And um, really that's what molded my mentality to be an athlete, you know? Um, and obviously my, my dad's from Chicago. So he was a big Chicago Bulls fan. Um, so they're, they're in the mid to late nineties, Michael Jordan was doing his thing. So my earliest memories, you know, with the family, we're watching sports, playing sports, man. So, uh, like you said, from Norman, Oklahoma, uh, went into high school here and then on to college and then the NFL. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know you could hoop back in the day. Like, you really was nice. <laughs> yeah, man, that's actually my first love. You know, like I said, my, my father was from Chicago, Chicago Bulls. Uh, Michael Jordan. I loved Kobe Bryant at the time. So I remember and, you know, call it second, third grade, you know, watching him. He had, he had, he had the Afro. I had the Afro. Um, so my first love was really basketball. I just didn't, I didn't grow. I kind of capped out when I was in, in fifth grade on height. I was a center then. And then everyone else just got taller and taller and taller. But yeah, I was an athletic man. And obviously playing sports or really football my whole life, it translated into basketball. Um, right. So I could be more physical, you know, I could steal the ball a bit different. I wasn't much of a shooter, but I was an active guy in basketball. Really, football translated had me play basketball a little bit. Um, sure, yeah, we, we had fun, man. Did you play anything else? Uh, basketball, football, and track, man. Right. It was just, you know, in the fall, it was football. Winter, spring was basketball. And then late spring, the summertime was track. And I did that since I was in second grade. Um, so started football, flag football in second grade, basketball, um, did the AAU circuit from probably second grade to call it eighth grade. Um, and then we always did the Hershey's track meet at the end of the year. Um, so I was always on the track. So we were always busy, man. Uh, I hear you. I hear you. So you you get through in high school, have a great career, and you end up at OU. Was that the first choice? I, but it actually was not the first choice. So to, just to give you a little backstory on why it was not the first choice. Um, when I was um, a sophomore in high school at Norman High, um, I, I led the state in interceptions. So a lot of teams were looking at me as a cornerback. Um, and so I guess at the time, OU was kind of stacked. They knew what they needed there. Um, and I just was not on the radar. Sophomore year, um, had like 14 catches on offense. So I wasn't just like a star. 
um, at the time, whereas I felt like I was a star on my team, don't get me wrong, but I was more of a defensive player. Same thing my junior year, I had 19 catches, um, and I think five or six interceptions, so everyone was like, all right, defensive guy. So I had some, you know, a bunch of Big 12 offers, had Big 10, SNC offers, um, and OU's just literally a mile away from Norman High, and they're not even looking at your boy, right? Um, and then I get into my senior year, um, and I started balling on offense. It was like we had all the early guys leave. Most of them do was a running back my junior year. He left. Coach Peters was our football, our, our head coach, and he's like, listen, like, we're the athletes, but Ryan can do it. So I played running back, <laughs> receiver, punt return, and I always had the ball in my hand. So that's when OU was like, okay, this guy's a real athlete. He can play offense and defense. Um, and just before that, Oklahoma State offered me. Then they came in the same day they offered me. Um, so I was kind of salty. I had a bunch of Big 12s. OSU came in, and OU was really the last one. Um, so it definitely wasn't my first choice. Um, but not to continue to ramble, I loved Texas at the time. They were just coming fresh off a of championship. So I was like, you know what? I want that Texas offer. So I didn't really care about OU. Um, and obviously, you get desensitized a little bit when it's right down the street from you. You know, it's like, I want to go to college. I want to travel away. Well, anyway, ultimately, I chose OU. Um, wanted to win championships, you know, um, have the opportunity to play in the NFL, which I did. And that's why I ultimately picked OU. Right. So I don't, I actually remember a specific play. I'm going to break this down for you. It's yeah. North versus High at Owen Field. Close game. This is when, like, Jeremy Dockery was playing or running back for oh, and all that. Oh, oh and, yes. And uh, we're kicking a field goal. And I'm, at the time, I'm on the sideline just watching. And I'll never forget you flying around that edge and just leapfrogging and blocking the kick. And I was just like, this I did that so many times. Bro, I'm like, this level of athlete is insane. Like, you're watching it from the side. So, and then uh -huh. even before, the year before that, Moses, I yeah. think one run play, every player on our defense touched. Every and I'm just play. like, these dudes are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we were just competitive, man. Y'all had some athletes too, man. But, um, you know, obviously when you get to the high school level, there's only a certain amount of people that get to the next one. And, you know, it happened to be us. And But, yeah, it was always a battle, man. And just to touch base on that Norman High Norman North game, we always won until my senior year. And then you guys took the crown. Uh, so y'all had some players, man. Y'all had some yeah. players moving. Sure. I actually, so I moved when that happened. I moved to Tulsa. You missed the last one then, huh? I, missed the, I went to Victory Christian in Tulsa. Uh, we ended up moving. Yeah. So I yeah. wasn't even part of that. That hurt my feelings. But no, so one of the things that I, um about your story that I think a lot of people should hear is your plan once you got through college, got to the NFL, how you spent your money. Because I can tell you right now, looking at my background, I don't manage money the best. I got <laughs> so it was impressive to hear that you had this plan. So I kind of wanted to hear your mindset into going to that and just kind of explain, you know, your thought process. Because that's a very mature way of thinking for somebody get coming into a lot of money like that. Yeah, well, man, I um, as a kid, man, it was my parents didn't have much money. Um, you know, I saw how hard they worked. Obviously, we, we got our work ethic. Me and my siblings got our work ethics from our parents. Um, but, you know, we worked for what we needed. So I'm in second grade mowing lawns um, to fund AAU basketball trips, you know. Uh, I'm mowing lawns or refing flag football games or baseball games in middle school so I can pay a cell phone bill, you know, like, and then so on and so forth. Got into college or into high school and um, I worked at the YMCA. I babysat kids. So, like, I always had that mentality. And I had to, it was really on me. And so I just understood, like, finance. It's not to the level I do now, but it's like, hey, you've got to work for what you need or what you want. And I understood the value of that. Um, now, yeah, I made mistakes, like not paying my cell phone bill. And, you know, I was splurging then as well. Um, but, yeah, just, just having that mentality where, like, I was always working for my own. I was really in this world myself. You know, my parents didn't have any financial literacy, so I just felt like it's on me. And then I get into college, and, you know, I'm really caught in high school. And they're like, listen, Ryan, like, there's coaches in my ear saying, listen, Ryan, you can set your, your family up for financial freedom or success down the road. And as an 18-year-old kid, I'm like, all right, that sounds good. But you hear that, right? I'm like, and then I go home and, you know, there's not always food on the table. You know, it's just one of those deals where it's like, okay, well, I have the opportunity. So as a young age, I'm just like, all right, well, I have the opportunity to change my family's life, their family's life. And so 
Knew I was going to get drafted. Um, crazy story, so I don't continue to ramble. I tore my ACL. I call it my junior year. You know, I was setting all kind of records. Um, at, at the college record. level. Good Lord. A lot of them still hold to this day, and I had the opportunity of going to the NFL. You know, I had a, a second, first or second round grade, um, or really a second round grade, grade as a junior in college. Um, I didn't feel like that was good enough. I felt like I balled hard enough to get the first round grade. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to come back. I'm going to improve my game. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to play in a national champion or another championship um, and really solidify myself as being the best receiver to ever play at OU. So I decided to come back my senior year. Eight games later, I tear my ACL. So everything that I worked for really was just a sense it felt like was taken from me. And so when I was going through the training process as a, a, after our, my senior year, you know, my, my agents like, listen, I've talked to GMs. I've talked to coaches. They're saying, Ryan, you can go from fit to undrafted. After a year before, I could have gone first or second round. So I'm like, dang, I could have I potentially, potentially just threw this money away. Well, obviously, I trained hard, um, ran the 40 on my own pro day. Then I get drafted in the second round. And at that moment, I'm like, listen, I, I'm blessed. I shouldn't even have the opportunity to get in the second round check. I got it. Um, and so I knew I was going to change my mentality there. Um, and then so they call it a rookie symposium. This is just summing up real quick. You go to the rookie symposium as a rookie before the football season. And one of the first segments that they talked about was 78% of athletes or really football players go broke within um, the first five years of retiring. I said, that's not going to be me. Years, it just all started making sense. Went home, tried to figure out what people do with their money um, and just continue to educate myself. So um, there are a lot of things that played a part into to really me just being financial, I guess, savvy or really illiterate, really illiterate. Well, so first of all, go ahead and ramble because we're going to love all of this. So you good. Yeah. You ain't got to keep apologizing for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but so I read something. I've been following you for a minute. Like, I would tell you yeah. the truth. Like, I've been following you for a minute. And I yeah. read something that where, like, you had a certain amount of expense, like money that you were spending a year with this contract that you got how much was that uh so originally it was sixty thousand dollars a year so just to just to give give somebody perspective i was making called over a million dollars a year um, we spent 60. Uh, my budget or our budget did not change much from college um to making it to the nfl you know we kept the same cars um, yes, our, we, we had a property that was more expensive than when we lived in our $500 for rent property in college, <laughs> um, but our expenses didn't change. We didn't eat. We still ate the same, you know, um, but yeah, we did go on vacation, but it's not, we didn't fill our house with nice furniture. We didn't go get new cars. We didn't go build a, mi a million dollar mansion. So, um, it, we didn't elevate, we, we made more money, but we didn't, we didn't have more, much more expenses. So really just to talk about that one. Uh, I guess that situation, a lot of people ask me questions about my budgeting. There were articles that were circulating about this, this person lived off $60,000 a year. How did he do it? Well, I, I met with the financial advisor and he simply asked, hey, do you guys have a, a budget? And I'm like, I don't have a budget. But he said, track your expenses for the next three to four months. We did that and we started hitting $5,000 a month, which is $60,000 a year. And this was net dollars. Um, so that's how we fell into that. And then essentially he said, listen, you forgot your budget. Now we know what you can invest. So this is as a 24-year-old rookie, I was getting this information and it was completely new. Like I said, growing up, didn't get that education, um, got a little money, met with the financial advisor and just started building the plan. And so I just started feeling like, okay, I have more control. I did not know this was a thing. So I start looking back at, you know, friends in my neighborhood, the parents that went to Woodier, you know what I mean? And I started saying like, wow, like this is what they were doing, right? right. Right. They started making right. sense. Oh, I've been to that house. He had a suit and tie on. Oh, they went and talked to this guy. Oh, he was a CPK. Oh, wow. So I didn't know that life. So now I started learning about it. I'm like, okay, this is a whole new life. So I was fascinated by it. So I really just obsessed on it. Got all kinds of books and read all kinds of articles on finances and real estate. And um, I felt like I had more control over finances than when I was a kid. You know, I just didn't know there was an actual step-by-step -step way to, to grow your wealth. And so um, I was ultra fascinated and I still am to this day. So do you think um, as far as, and it's not just, you know, black kids, this is all kids, but do you think that that's something that we're struggling with as far as developing our youth is teaching them financial literacy? Yeah, there's stories all the time where they said that's the one thing that they need to update in the schools is, is financial literacy. You know, we, I, so what was it, third grade, we learned how to write a check. Like, okay, cool. Yeah, we still write checks, but like, we need to learn, like, what does the credit score look like? You know, it, it's, it, it's not until 
people get into trouble that you start to realize, okay, dang, I was almost too late, you know? Um, so yeah, in schools, there needs to be information about CPAs. What does an accountant do? What does an attorney do? What does a contract look like? What does personal finances mean? Um, and then really just building out a plan for just overall financial literacy, you know? Um, but yeah, it's definitely a lack in schools. And I do think that, that that's what makes it divide even bigger from the haves and the haves not. The, the yeah. haves, they know that world. They're teaching their kids. Their kids are seeing that. The other side is not getting that education and it's not, it's not, a, it's not at the school level. So it, everyone needs to learn about it. And, and, there, and people like us doing a podcast talking about it, man, at the end of the day. For sure, for sure. That's why, I'm, like I said, I was excited to get you all here for that. So you're, you're starting to save your money. You're heading the budget. Let me ask this. I know you're a married man, been with her for a while. Was it hard to get her on board with that lifestyle? No, it was actually almost the other way around. So um, <laughs> I, I made money growing up by mowing and things like that, and I would spend it. And there were times mm -hmm. where it's like, hey, the cell phone bill is due on the first. I don't get paid till the fifth, and then I need to fill my car up on the fifth, and then we get to the tenth, and then I'll pay my bill. Whereas yeah. when I, I met my wife and moved in together my senior year in college, she's like, no, I, when that bill comes in, you got to pay the bill. <laughs> uh, so, so she was the one that was like, she helped me in my, in my development, development as well. Um, so it definitely was not hard to get her on board. Um, once I started getting fascinated with the finances, she'd ask questions. She still asks questions today. And yeah. it blows my mind, you know, this many years later, she'll ask me questions. And I'm like, wow, like, okay, you've been listening. Oh, you've been learning. So it's, it's pretty special. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's good to hear. So what, what started real estate? What started real estate? Um, so when I'm a, a whatever I call it, I'm a senior in college or in high school. Um, I had a teacher literally on the last day of school. Her name was Rachel. She said, hey, Ryan. She knew that I had an opportunity of making it. You know, she was like, Ryan, like, I know your situation. Do you need a summer job? And so I got a summer job, uh, my, my freshman year in college, I worked with the special needs kids at the YMCA up here off of Robinson. Um, and her family was in real estate. So when we would go on our bowling trips or our zoo trips or whatever it might be, she would drive by a neighborhood and say, hey, my father developed this, my father owns this. And so she would just put these nuggets to me over the, the last, the, I guess the, the remaining four years of college and I'm like, wow, okay, she kind of developed things over time. But don't get me wrong, I was a college kid. I was having fun playing ball, hanging out with my friends, feeling like I'm on cloud nine. But she was planting the seed over time. Then it's like, aha, Ryan, you're a senior. You can get paid. Well, hey, when you do make it, we have an opportunity to help you grow your wealth. So she's actually one of the first people um, that helped me buy a rental property back in 2013. Um, I bought my first one in 2012. Um, through another friend of mine that um, played in college, um, his parents, or I guess his, his cousins or aunts or something like that, lived out in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He said, hey, here's a heck of a deal. Bought a house for 19,500 bucks, put $20,000 in it. And I doubled my money in a, in a span of six weeks and I didn't even show up. Wow. Um, so I was essentially hooked. Then just started buying real properties and learning along the way. You know, obviously it takes time to develop into any space that you get into. So when I was fresh and new, I just heavily leaned on mentors, you know, um, and I just started to develop my own style and now I get to mentor people. Um, so yeah, 2012 is when it started and um, went full time in 2016 after I retired from the NFL um, and just started identifying different things. So we've done things from, you know, fixing flips to buying holds to um, ground up construction, you know, I learned the, the finance side of things, the CPA side, tax side of things, and um, it's been a fun process, man. That's awesome. So I, my, I just talked to my uncle a week ago. He's been in mortgage for 20 years. He owns his own mortgage okay. business. So that actually prompted me to message you because I'm like, all oh, right, I, I oh, yeah. can see what he's talking about. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that he talked to me about was as far as real estate, a lot of people might be afraid because they need like a certain amount of money to start. Yeah. What's your thought process on that? Uh, well, yeah, just in anything worthwhile, you need some type of money. Um, and you need some type of capital, call it that. You either have a good credit score with funds 
or you have mental capital and you can put the deal together. You know, so there's two sides to it. But yes, it is it is it is capital intensive. Um, there's multiple ways to get into the game. You can get into the game as a wholesaler with no money, which, you know, anything that has um, multiple entry points with low overhead, obviously there's more competition down there. And then you start to elevate. But yes, real estate, for most people, they can afford to buy their own home. Um, what I suggest to people, a lot of gurus in this world, I guess we would call them gurus, but you know, some, some real estate models, they will say, listen, your first house, you should go ahead and get a duplex. Um, and so that, if you want to be an investor, you get the duplex before you buy the single family home because you can qualify with the same income, right? Say, for instance, in our market, you buy a duplex for $250,000. Say you can buy a single family for $250,000. You buy the duplex, you have two units, one unit's paying your rent, and essentially you'll pay half for the mortgage. Whereas if you own one, you're paying all of it, right? Yeah. And so what most people do with the start of home, they usually level up. So if you go from the single family to leveling up to another one, you have one unit. But say you have the duplex and you level up, now you have two units. And so I think that's what gets the ball rolling. Whereas a lot of people say, you know what? I'm ready to start a family. I'm ready to have kids. Uh, I'm going to go get the house first. Well, usually if you do that, it's going to slow down your time to become... I wouldn't say a great investor, but it's going to slow you down. So yeah. for instance, it takes about five or call it five to seven years for you to double your money. And most people stay in their house for 10 years. So say you go and you get a duplex and you move out and call it five years later, this duplex will most likely turn to four in the next five years if this thing is cash flowing. So now you have four units and you're living in one. Whereas if you go from single family to a single family, you've got one to shuffle with. And then that one turns to two. Whereas you could have been at four. Does that make sense? No, it makes 100% um, so, sense. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, but it's not for everybody. Not everyone loves real estate. Um, not everyone likes to turn on HGTV and look at, you know, whatever shows on in different houses. You know, some of people want to do other things. But I do think um, the biggest asset class in the world is one is, is the, the finances and, and the stock market. And number two is real estate. So I feel like if you want to jump in a world where you're going to be able to make money long term, um with minimum downtime time or downside when you look at inflation and where people are spending their money you pick one of the two um so, so it was an easy decision for me so uh i also talked to him about one of the things he said is certain people having like it factors um big personalities where you're able to make those deals seal those deals <laughs> network to the right people i would assume yeah. Knowing you, you have that, obviously. And then you got the Sooner background, especially in Oklahoma. Do you think yeah. that gives advantage in those situations? Oh, there's, there's an advantage in so many different things in life. I definitely think me being an athlete um, in Norman, Oklahoma, where everyone loves football, um, it definitely gives me a leg up. Now, I couldn't go walk into a bank and not know my numbers and understand the market. They're not going to give me money. I don't care if I'm me or not, you know, right. so I definitely have learned things along the way to do that. Now, I will say this, for somebody that doesn't have a, a household name, banks need to lend money, whether it's to you or to me. So if you walk in there, you know what you're doing, you have some mental and physical capital, they're going to play ball with you. Now, I will say this, you can't just walk in there and just think it's going to get done. You need to essentially say, hey, mentor, find a mentor. Hey, mentor, what does this look like? What do you need to get done? Well, I would advise for you to have your, your profit loss statement, your financial plans, your two years tax return. And once you go in there, you are setting the tone saying, hey, I am a professional. You're not just winging it. Right. Um, and they're going to give you the money. They will, right. If you know what you're doing and you can make a safe bet on their money, they're going to work with you. It's no different than me looking at you and saying, hey, bro, like I need 20 bucks. I'll get you back tomorrow or next week. If you trust me, it's no different than me walking to the bank and saying, hey, here's the plan. I'm an honest person. Here's the numbers to back it. Do you trust in me? It's no different. Just bigger okay. numbers. Okay, most definitely. So, when you when you're when you're doing the uh, real estate, is this like solely you, or you have a group of people that are investing in this as well? Um, I have one partner on my deals. Okay. Um, yeah, but that's probably a, a fourth of my portfolio. The rest are mine. That's it. Uh, yeah. So yes, um, I would say this. If you are going to find a partner, make sure that you have the same long-term vision. 
Um, but yes, most of our properties we own by ourselves. It's me, my wife, she helps on the side, um, really day to day now that we're selling real estate. Um, and we have, um, we have an admin and transaction manager. So our team has built and grown. So now we're able to do different things in the market. Um, at first we were just buy and hold investors, went into the distressed properties. I would bet the properties. My wife would design the property. I'd make sure I could go back to the bank and refinance my money out. Um, after I did that, we just hold the property. So then we started a property management company to self-manage those properties. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're into the selling and we're in the building phase. So our team's kind of built up, um, vertically integrated now. Um, so it's been, it's been fun. But yes, it started out originally me and my wife and the team slowly got bigger. Okay, good deal. So when you, as far as looking at properties and knowing where to go and invest, there's still, obviously there's a risk, yeah. um, but it's, you're, you're, you're doing everything to make the most calculated risk. What are the, some of the things that you're looking at when you're looking at properties? Um, really, or single families or duplexes, you know, first and foremost, I, I would suggest anybody starting out, just start where you know. You can, we can drive to Norman, Oklahoma. We've been here for our whole lives. We know what side of town's good. We know what side of town's not as good. We know what side of town has, um, you know, good, a good walkable location. We know what has the good school. So that's where you want to put your money. Now, there's not to say that there's not more money to be made in other areas, but as a starter, you want to just be in an area that you know, you're familiar with. And then you can work down from there. My rate of return, my ROI, which means if I put such a thousand dollars in, I make a thousand dollars, it's a hundred percent return. Now you're going to have to look at different properties that match that. Um, so if you go into a higher end area, you're, you're more stable. You know, you're going to find more qualified tenants to rent the properties, but your cash flow is going to be a little bit lower because you have to spend more money on the property. Whereas if you go to the lower end, you're spending less money up front, but there could be some different challenges along the way. Um, <clears throat> So you can, it just depends. You can get in the game and spend a million dollars on a house. You can get in the game and spend 75,000. Um, so then it just depends on your temperament at that point. I mean, really your long-term goals. Am I in this to fix and flip and get the money out in three months? Or am I in this to give this to my kids when they're 20 years old? Um, so that'll allow you to dictate where you want to spend your money as well. So it's not a one size fits all. There's different indicators that you want to look at depending on your game plan. So with was the time during the pandemic and obviously we're still going through did that impact you negatively or positively as far well, as real what, estate goes? What, what happened with COVID? Yeah. There was definitely a scare. There was a point where we collected around 78 to 80 percent of our rents. Um, we're usually at 100. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a time we had a handful of tenants out of all the properties that we had. They either called and said, listen, I lost my job or um, it was really, I lost my job originally. And so we'd work with them. And that's when assistance took a little bit of time to get going to start help funding them. Some of those tenants went months without paying, uh, <clears throat> which is never fun for uh, uh, somebody that holds property. Uh, yeah. There was times where they would get on housing and they're good to go. And then there's times where some jobs, some people or tenants would have a job and COVID hit in March and then in April or May, they'd come back and say, hey, Ryan, they, they reduced our hours because no one knew when COVID was going to be over. Um, and then government assistance started to come in and, you know, churches jumped on board. So there was about six months where it was kind of like, it was iffy, but I knew at the end of the day, you know, we're going to get through this. Um, I, I make sure to have some type of extra capital, um, not for COVID reasons, but to make sure I can maintain my properties. Um, so when that did happen, we were able to help some tenants out. Um, let them forego rent. Some of the tenants we trust and we felt good with, we just we just put rent on the back end. Um, so there was just multiple ways that we can deal with it. But yes, it was scary for everybody. We didn't know what it looked like. I knew at the end of the day, the banks didn't want these houses to go well under. Uh, right. Worst case scenario, I go to the bank and say, hey, I need interest only. So right. essentially you have a principal and interest payment. For anybody that doesn't know, you're paying, call it on a thousand dollar mortgage, you're paying 500 to, to principal, you're paying 500 to um, to interest, um, worst case scenario, I can cut my expenses in half and since you just keep the numbers clean. If I said, hey, bank, um, I've lost some tenants, which I didn't have to do. Um, I lost some tenants due to COVID. Um, can you reduce my, my mortgage payment? Just give me interest only. And I have multiple friends that did that, whether they, they own commercial or residential, and the banks usually work with them. And then the feds come in and infuse money into the system, make it, 
things a little bit easier for everybody. You had the stimulus checks and then our tenants started getting stimulus checks and then things were kind of moving. Uh, right. But yeah, it was scary for everybody in every industry. So knock on wood, if this was ever to happen again, would you say you're more prepared now? Uh, I, I, I think we did a decent job with everything that happened then. Uh, right. I, I'm not going to just sit here and play more defense. I felt like we, we had a good uh, reserves to make sure that we were capable of paying for those things. But if we had another one and the government didn't come in, um, it would probably be a little bit tougher. Um, but America is strong, man, for the most part, and that was good. It took a little bit of time to get the stimulus out. But, geez, if you look at the market now compared to a year ago, um, things are – there's a lot more liquidity in the market, man. So they did something right. Whereas some people think inflation is going to happen down the road, uh, but they got us out of this hole for the time being. Well, I'm in Kansas city now, Missouri. And yeah. The market here is insane. I mean, like houses go up and be gone. I think we spoke to somebody that said that they put their house up within that first day, they got to offer 50,000 over the price that they set. So yeah. then they realized oh, I can charge more, and then upped it, and somebody met that, and they sold in, like, a couple of days. It's crazy. Ah, uh, it's wild. It is very wild right now. It is. Yeah, that, that's good. So, I wanted to ask, obviously, you grew up as a football player. You grew up as an athlete. Were there any skills that you acquired as a football player that you were able to use moving forward into real estate and becoming the mogul that you are and doing those things? Yeah, I just think work ethic at the end of the day, you know, um, that that was definitely an influencer. You know, you can't be an entrepreneur and not have some type of work ethic. You know, you can't work for yourself and not have something pushing you. Whereas, you know, if you get a job, it's, hey, I've got to clock in. I've got to, I've got to do this by the end of the day. As an entrepreneur, it's on you. No one's knocking on the door saying, yeah, you got to get this done. And so as an athlete, no, coaches, yeah, we had we had workouts, mandatory workouts and lifts. But the if we wanted to continue to get better, we need to catch balls on our own. We need to do extra footwork on our own. And so that's what I've taken over into this world. And obviously, playing at the University of Oklahoma, one of the best franchises in college football, I got to see the day to day and how Coach Stoops and Joe Castiglione ran that organization. It was bigger than life. They had, you know, they had the people in different positions to make things efficient and everyone had their skills. So I take my work ethic and then I build out my team. Okay. I need systems. You know, I remember every football practice was this hour and 45 minutes and every 15, 10 minutes was segmented. This is what you're doing now. This is what you're doing now. So my day to day, even with my employees, we're on the phone at 930 on this day by this time, I'm time-stamped to do this job. By this time, I'm time-stamped to do this time, do this job. And so I got to just take pieces from that, from the football world and just mold it into my own. Um, and so it's, it's been fun to grow and, and, you know, put together different systems and corner different markets. Um, but yeah, sports has definitely been very vital and, and seeing how some of the, the organizations before me and how athletes work out and try to figure it out on their own, um, it's definitely helped. Awesome. So one of the things I always talk about and all the people that I've discussed is reaching beyond the surface level. Um, and what I mean by that is I can see Ryan Royals and be like, I want to do that. Like, I want to be the college athlete. I want to get into real estate. And it looks great on Facebook. It looks great on Instagram. But nobody really knows what it took for you to get there. So my question to ask, what is one of the biggest like obstacles you hit in real estate that you think somebody could benefit from here? Obstacles. Ah, uh, man, I think it took me forever to say that, hey, I am a, and this probably not, it might not pertain to any, uh, everybody on this, watching this, but um, my biggest thing was trying to become something different than a football player. So I was doing real estate for a number of years, but I never owned it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, this is something I'm doing. Oh, I can go coach. Oh, this is something I'm doing. Oh, I can go do, um, broadcasting you know I was it was one foot in one foot out um so what I would say for most people is listen just jump in that 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 I would say I would be much further along not that I'm in a bad place now but if I would have committed two three years before I did and said you know what this is my career 
and owned it, then I feel like I'd be much farther along. Now, obviously, I don't know how long I'm going to live and things are in place for a reason. I am blessed to be where I am. So I would say for anybody that's looking to do anything, whether it's real estate or starting their own business, learn, find a mentor and jump. You know, the quicker you start to make those mistakes, the quicker you're going to learn and elevate from them. There is no reward without some type of risk. Um, So that's, that's really what I have to say on that. But real estate, you know, the biggest obstacle was just saying, hey, I, I am, I'm not just a football player. I'm going to go do, do something different. And I, I'll be candid and honest with you. When I do hit the next level, I look at my wife and I'm like, like wow, this is, this is kind of cool. This is special. Like, did we do that? Because I'm still in this mode where I've always been a football player. And so I surprised myself saying, oh, wow, I can play their game too. You know, oh, they're doing, oh I can do that. Um, so I, I definitely get energy from that. That's awesome. So, and one of the things, even before we started this, you're like, I got to put my books away. So I'm studying, which I think a lot of people need to know, like you're still at this point, but you're still getting better. You're still perfecting that craft. You're still developing, which there's no level of complacency or being comfortable, even though you're pretty successful. Yeah. Well, I, I think at, at the, there's, um, if I want to look at what are the stock market terms, right? There's a, the support, right? And um, what do you call it? You got you got you got the top and the bottom, right? Um, you got resistance, sorry, resistance, and you have support, right? A lot of people will play in this area for a while, and then when you and there's 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 challenges and there's successes between between this this support and this resistance. But when you break through the resistance, you hit another level. There's going to be more challenges, right? And the same to the next and the next and the next. So there's never, you will never know enough because you're going to hit new challenges. Yes, there was a time where I didn't need a bookkeeper, right? Oh, well, we got a little bit bigger. I need a bookkeeper. Now I got a vet. How do I find a good bookkeeper? How do I keep them on their toes? Okay, well, now we need um, another lender that does million dollar plus loans. Okay, how do I need to present myself there? So now I have another challenge. You know what I mean? And so, oh, things are growing. Now I need to bring in a CPA. Like it's just, you just keep hitting different levels, you know? Um, and obviously more time in the game, you become a professional, you know? Right. That's why you call professionals. You spend time to get there. Call right. it 10 hours, you know? For sure, for sure. So last question, um, what, are, what are you looking at future-wise with your ventures? What's the, what's, you talking about that next level. So what level are you seeing? Oh, man, I, I've been telling my wife lately, I see this building, right? This building that says Broyles Real Estate Group on it. And I, we got to pull this up in a few years. I, I, I just feel it, right? right. Real estate group, and we've got one branch in there that's um, our property management, which we already have. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got an office in there. I got my ping pong tables in there, my basketball <laughs> tables. We're about business, right? So I got one office in there as property management. I got another office in there as buyer, buyer or real estate agents buying and selling properties. And then we have an acquisition office. Um, and then we have... Um, a, a hard money office. So that's going to be, that. that's my next five-year goal. Um, we've done a lot of those things already. You know, it's just, we have to continue to evolve and bring more people on. Um, so that's that's what I see next, um, at least in the business world. Obviously on the, on the family side, you know, we, we, we love to vacate. We love to go on vacation. So I'm going to make sure that that's always in the forefront of my mind. Um, and then at some point, man, I want to be, I built my whole life and foundation on, on finances through financial literacy and financial independence. So at some point, you know, um, at 40, 42, 43 years old, I want to be able to be at the beach and have the, you know, the newly appointed CEO of the Bros Real Estate Group and say, hey, how's it going? Like, who's the new teammate? You know, how are we doing? And that's, that's really my vision. Um, you know, really just leaving, leaving that legacy for the kids, man. Um, yeah. So that, those are really my, my goals and aspirations, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. So one of the things I do on these, I call it the mentality moment. I don't even know if I've ever explained to you what mentality is, but it started with mine, which stands for motivation is not enough. And then I added mentality after Kobe died because that was uh, my guy. So man, Mamba yeah. mentality, my yeah. mentality, and put it together. Yeah. Um, but basically, it's just, I feel like it fits. I lift weights. Like, that's what I do. But yeah. I feel like it fits every person because, like, motivation, I have to tell people it dissolves. Like, you're not 
always going to be motivated to get up early to study to do whatever you got to rely on your work ethic your discipline which you've talked about so in the mentality moment i like to highlight something that i think can be reiterated for later and yeah. definitely the thing that you said that resonates the most with me is just being committed fully um i think a lot of people do that i've even done that where it's like i see something i really like i want but it's like man it's a risk like there's a lot of fear there's a lot of doubt and i don't commit yeah. And like yeah. you said, that can hold you back two or three years because you won't jump into it. So I appreciate you sharing that because I think that's something people really will hear and it might inspire somebody to be like, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm going to jump in. Yeah, well, that's good you say that, man, because it's you're, you're not going to win all of them. Um, you're going to lose, right? It's just it's the part of it. But when you start taking those risks, you elevate yourself, you know, and then you'll start to feel like this synergy where it's like, you know what? Everyone's been playing here. I at least I took the leap. So then you have the confidence to take the leap and the leap and to grow. Um, and then bring the people under you that that didn't feel the same way. And that's what continues that synergy. It makes you want to continue. And then you just get in this trajectory where it's just positive, right? You're bringing people along. You're leveling up. You're doing more and more things. Um, but yeah, you've got to jump. And even to piggyback on that, a lot of people jump. And then they jump out and they go do something else. And they jump yeah. out and they go do something else. You got to put your time in. I tell people all the time, Amazon wasn't built overnight. Google wasn't built overnight. Facebook wasn't built overnight. And obviously there were challenges along the way. So you got to, if you're fully committed, you put your time in and it's going to make it work. A lot of people say like, how do I keep doing this? How, well, you've got to just change your standards. You know, if you used to go to bed at midnight, start going to bed at 1030. Guarantee you're gonna feel better tomorrow, right? That's just get all automatic. You don't wake up and feel your body, and you start to wake up and feel your body. Um, automatically, you're gonna have more energy. Okay, mm -hmm. with the more energy, then I get to do. Now I go to the gym. Like, oh, it's you're just doing good things, and you continue doing. You're making better choices more times than not, and you're just naturally gonna to start to elevate. I, that I, there's no way around that. For sure, for sure, man. Well. I want to make sure I say thank you, bro, for being on this. Like I said, I know you're a busy guy, but uh, it was really a blessing for you to come on and share these gems for us. Uh, I've been yeah. telling everybody that I could that I'm about to have Ryan Boyles on here. So uh, it's been it's been something that I've been looking forward to and learning, which I did. So I just want to say thank you for that. Uh, for those that are watching, uh, check the description. I'll have all of Ryan's information if you guys want to look into some of his like real estate ventures or I know you started a group on Facebook. I'm actually a part of that. We'll link that. Same thing for those listening. That'll be in the description. Anything else you want to say, man? Man, I, I appreciate you letting me share my story, man. Uh, so yeah, I, I'll look online when you get that stuff posted, man. I'll love to be shared. If y'all have any questions, just holler at me. I'm an open book, man. All right. Thank you. I have a good.